people don't often talk about the AI alignment problem as a two-way street. And maybe that's we true. Yeah, as it becomes more and more intelligent, it um, it will know that you don't love it back. Yeah, <laughs> and there's a humbling aspect to that that we may have to sacrifice as any any effective collaboration. Exactly, it, it might have some compromises. Yeah. And uh, that's the thing, we're creating something that will one day be more powerful than we are. And for many, many aspects, it is already more powerful than we are for some of these capabilities. We cannot, like think, suppose that chimps had invented humans. Yes. And they said, great, humans are great, but we're gonna make sure that they're aligned and that they're only at the service of chimps. <laughs> it would be a very different planet we would live in right now. So there's a whole, area of work uh, in AI safety that does consider super intelligent AI and ponders the existential risks of it. In some sense, when we're looking down into the muck, into the mud and not up at the stars, it's easy to forget that these systems might just might get there. Do you think about this kind of possibility that AGI systems, super intelligent AI systems might threaten humanity in some way that's even bigger than just uh, affecting the economy, affecting the human condition, affecting the nature of work, but literally threaten human civilization. The example that I think is in everyone's consciousness is um, HAL mm -hmm. in Audio Space 2001, um, where HAL exhibits a malfunction and what is a malfunction? That like the two different systems compute a slightly different bit that's off by one. So first of all, let's untangle that. Um, if you have an intelligent system, you can't expect it to be 100% identical every time you run it. Basically, the sacrifice that you need to make to achieve intelligence and creativity is consistency. Mm -hmm. So it's unclear whether that quote unquote glitch is a sign of creativity or truly a problem. That's one aspect. The second aspect is the humans basically are on a mission to recover this monolith. And the AI has the same exact mission. Mm -hmm. And suddenly the humans turn on the AI and they're like, we're gonna kill Hal, we're gonna disconnect it. And Hal is basically saying, listen, I'm, I'm here on a mission. The humans are misbehaving. Like the mission is more important than either me or them. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna accomplish the mission even at my peril and even at their peril. So in that movie, the alignment problem is front and center. Basically says, okay, alignment is nice and good, but alignment doesn't mean obedience. We don't call it obedience, we call it alignment. And alignment basically means that sometimes the mission will be more important than the humans. And sort of, you know, the US government has a price tag on the human life if they're you know, sending a mission or if they're reimbursing expenses or you name it, at some point, every, every like, you know, you can't function if life is infinitely valuable. So when the AI is basically trying to decide whether to, you know, I don't know, dismantle a bomb that will kill an entire city at the sacrifice of two humans, I mean, Spider-Man always saves the lady and saves the world, mm -hmm. but at some point, Spider-Man will have to choose to let the lady die because the world has more value. And these ethical dilemmas are gonna be there for AI. Basically, if that monolith is essential to human existence and millions of humans are depending on it and two humans on the ship are trying to sabotage it, you know, where's the alignment? The, the challenge is, of course, as the system becomes more and more intelligent, it can escape the box of the objective functions and the constraints it's supposed to operate under. It's very difficult as the more intelligent it becomes to anticipate the unintended consequences of a fixed objective function. And so it, there would be just, I mean, this is the, the sort of famous paperclip maximizer. In uh, trying to maximize yeah. the, the wealth of a nation or whatever objective we encode in, it might, just destroy human civilization, not meaning to, 
but on the path to optimize, it, it seems like any function you try to optimize eventually leads you into a lot of trouble. So we have a paper recently that uh, you know looks at Goodhart's law. Mm -hmm. It basically says every metric that becomes an objective ceases to be a good metric. Yes. <laughs> so yes. in in our paper, we're basically, actually the paper has a very cute title. It's called uh, Death by Round Numbers and Sharp Thresholds. <laughs> nice. And it's basically looking at these discontinuities in biomarkers associated with disease. And we're finding that a biomarker that becomes an objective ceases to be a good biomarker. That basically, like the moment you make a biomarker a treatment decision, that biomarker used to be informative of risk, but it's now inversely correlated with risk because you use it to, in, to sort of induce treatment. Um, in a similar way, you can have a single metric without having the ability to revise it. Because if that metric becomes a sole objective, it will cease to be a good metric. And if an AI is sufficiently intelligent to do all these kinds of things, you should also empower it with the ability to decide that the objective has now shifted. Mm -hmm. And um, again, when we think about alignment, we should be really thinking about it as, let's think of the greater good, not just the human good. And yes, of course, human life should be much more valuable than many, 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 many things. But at some point, you're not gonna sacrifice the whole planet to save one human being. There's a, an interesting open letter that was just released from uh, several folks at MIT, Max Tegmark, uh, Elon Musk, and a few others that is asking AI companies to put a six month hold on any further training of large language models, AI systems. Can you make the case for that kind of halt and against it? So the big thing that we should be saying is what did we use the la what, what, what did we do the last six months when we saw that coming? <laughs> and if we were completely inactive in the last six months, what makes us think that we'll be a little better in the next six months? Yeah. So this whole six month thing, I think is a little silly. It's like, no, let's just get, get busy, do what we were gonna do anyway. And we should have done it six months ago. Sorry, we messed up. Let's work faster now. Because if we basically say, why don't you guys pause for six months? And then, you know, we'll think about doing something. In six months, we'll be exactly the same spot. Mm -hmm. So my answer is, tell us exactly what you were going to do the next six months. Tell us why you didn't do it the last six months and why the next six months will be different. And then let's just do that. Conversely, as you train these large models with more parameters, the alignment becomes sometimes easier. That as the systems become more capable, they actually become less dangerous than more dangerous. Mm -hmm. So in a way it might actually be counterproductive to sort of fix the March 2023 version and not get to experience the possibly safer September 2023 version. That's actually a really interesting thought. There's several interesting thoughts there, but the idea is that this is the birth of something that is sufficiently powerful to do damage and is not too powerful to do uh, irreversible damage. And at the same time, it's sufficiently complex to be able to, for us to uh, enable to study it. So we can investigate all the different ways it goes wrong, all the different ways we can make it safer, all the different policies from a government perspective that we want to in terms of regulation or not, how we uh, perform, for example, the uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback in such a way that gets it to not do as much hate speech as it naturally wants to, all that kind of stuff. And, and have a public discourse and enable the, the very thing that you're a huge proponent of, which is diversity. So give time for other companies to launch other models, give time to uh, launch open source models and to start to play where a lot of the research community, brilliant folks such as yourself start to play with it before it runs away in, in terms of the scale of impact it has on society. My recommendation would be a little different. It would be let the Google and the Meta Facebook and all of the other lar large models, make them open, make them transparent, make them accessible. Let OpenAI continue to train larger and larger models. Let them continue to train larger and larger models. 
let let the world experiment with the diversity of AI systems rather than sort of fixing them now. And you, you can't stop progress. Progress needs to continue, in my view. And what we need is more experimenting, more transparency, more openness, rather than, oh, open AI is ahead of the curve. Let's stop it right now until everybody catches up. I, I think that um, doesn't make complete sense to me. The other component is we should, yes, be cautious with it, and we should like not give it the nuclear codes, but um, as we make more and more plugins, yes, the system will be capable of more and more things. But right now, I think of it as just an extremely able and capable assistant that has these emergent behaviors, which are stunning, rather than something that will suddenly escape the box and, and, and shut down the world. And the third component is that we should be taking a little bit more responsibility for how we use these systems. Basically, if I take the most kind human being and I brainwash them, I can get them to do hate speech overnight. That doesn't mean we should stop any kind of education of all humans. Mm -hmm. We should stop misusing the power that we have over these influenceable models. So I think that the people who get it to do hate speech, they should take responsibility for that hate speech. I think that giving a powerful car to a bunch of people or giving a truck or a garbage truck should not basically say, oh, we should stop all garbage trucks until we like, because we can run one in, one of them into a crowd. Mm -hmm. No, people have done that. And there's laws and there's like regulations against, you know, running trucks into the crowd. Trucks are extremely dangerous. We're not gonna stop all trucks until we make sure that none of them runs into a crowd. No, we just have laws in place and we have mental health in place and we take responsibility for our actions when we use these otherwise very beneficial tools like garbage trucks for nefarious uses. So in the same way, you can't expect a car to never you know, do any damage when used in especially like specifically malicious ways. And right now we're basically saying, oh, well, we should have this super intelligent system that can do anything but it can't do that. I'm like, no, it can do that, but it's up to the human to take responsibility for not doing that. And when you get it to like spew malicious, like hate speech stuff, you should be responsible. So there's a lot of tr tricky nuances here that makes this different because it's software. So you can deploy it at scale and it can have the same viral impact that software can. So you can create bots that are human-like and they can do a lot of really interesting stuff. So the raw GPT-4 version, you can ask, how do I tweet that I hate, they have this in the paper, yeah, yeah, I remember. that I hate yeah. Jews in a way that's not going to get taken down by Twitter. You yeah. can literally ask that. Or you can ask, how do I make a bomb for $1? Yeah. And if it, it's able to generate that knowledge, yeah, but at the same time, you can Google the same things. It makes it much more accessible. So the scale becomes interesting because if you can do all this kind of stuff in a very accessible way at scale where you can tweet it, there is the network effects that we have to start to think about. Yeah, it it but fundamentally again. is the same thing, but the speed of the viral spread of the information that's already available might have a different level of effect. I think it's an evolutionary arms race. Nature gets better at making mice, engineers get better at making mouse traps. <laughs> and um, you know, yeah. as as basically you ask it, hey, can how can I evade Twitter censorship? Well, you know, Twitter should just update its censorship so that you can catch that as well. And so no matter how fast the development happens, the the defense will just get faster. Yeah. We just have to be responsible as human beings and kind to each other. Yeah, but there's a technical question. Can we always win the race? And I suppose there's no ever guarantee that we'll win the race. We will never. Like, you know, with my wife, we were basically saying, hey, are we ready for kids? My answer was, I was never ready to become a professor. And yet I became a professor and I was never ready to be a dad. And then guess what? The kid came and like, I became ready. <laughs> so Ready or not, here I come. But the reality is we might one day wake up and there's a, a challenge overnight that's extremely difficult. For example, we can wake up to the birth of billions of bots that are human-like on Twitter, and we can't tell the difference between human and machine. Shut them down. Like how you don't know how to shut them down. 
it, it, there's a fake Manolis on Twitter that seems to be as real as the real Manolis. Yeah. How do we figure out which one is real? Again, this is a problem where an nefarious human can impersonate me and you might have trouble telling them apart. Yeah. Just because it's an AI doesn't make it any different of a problem. But the scale you can achieve, this is the scary thing, is the speed and uh, the, the speed with which yeah. you can achieve it. But Twitter has passwords and Twitter has usernames. And if it's not your username, the fake Lex Friedman is not gonna have a billion followers, etc. cetera. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, th th this all of this becomes, <laughs> so both the hacking uh, of people's accounts, f first of all, like phishing becomes much yeah, easier. but that's already a problem. It's not like AI will not change that. No, 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 AI makes it much more effective. Currently, the emails, the phishing scams are pretty dumb. Like to click on it, you have to be not paying attention. But they're, you know, with, with language models, they can be really damn convincing. So what you're saying is that we never had humans smart enough to make a great scam, and we now have an AI that's smarter than most humans, or all of the humans. Well, this is the big difference, is there seems to be human level linguistic capabilities. Yeah, that for, and at, in fact, superhuman level. Superhuman level. Yeah. It's like saying, I'm not gonna allow, I'm not gonna allow machines to compute multiplications of a hundred digit numbers because humans can't do it. I'm like, no, just do it, don't misuse it. No, but it. You, we can't disregard, I mean, that's a good point, but we can't disregard the power of language in human society. I mean, yes, you're right. But that seems like a scary new reality we don't have answers for yet. I remember saying, when Gary Kasparov was basically saying, you know, <laughs> great, you know, chess beats you, like chess machines beat humans at chess. Yeah. You know, are you, like, are people gonna still go to chess tournaments? And his answer was, you know, well, we have cars that go much faster than humans, and yet we still go to the Olympics to watch humans run. So <laughs> that's for entertainment, but what about for the spread of information and news? right? Uh, whether it has to do with the pandemic or the political election or anything. It's, it, it's a scary reality where there's a lot of convincing bots that are human-like telling us I stuff. I think that if we wanna regulate something, it shouldn't be the training of these models. It should be the utilization of these models for X, Y, Z activity. So, yeah, like, yes, guidelines and guards should be there, but against specific set of utilizations. Sure. I think simply saying we're not gonna make any more trucks is not the way. That's what people are a little bit scared about the idea. They're very torn on the open sourcing. Yeah, yeah. The very people that kind of are proponents of open sourcing have also spoken out in this case, we want to keep a closed source because there's going to be, you know, putting large language models, pre-trained, fine-tuned through uh, RL with human feedback, putting in the hands of, I don't know, terrorist organizations of a kid in a garage who just wants to have a bit of fun through trolling. Uh, it's a scary world, because again, scale can be achieved. And we, the, the bottom line is, I think why they're asking six months or some time is we don't really know how powerful these things are. It's been just a few days and they seem to be really damn good. I am so ready to be replaced. I, I, <laughs> seriously, I'm, I'm so ready. Like you, you have no idea how excited so the, I am. In a positive way, meaning In a like... positive way, where basically all of the mundane aspects of my job and maybe even my, my full job, if, if it turns out that an AI is better, I find it very discriminative. Yeah. To basically say you can only hire humans because they're inferior. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's discrimination. If an AI is better than me at training students, get me out of the picture. Just let the AI train the students. I mean, please, because like, what do I want? Do I want jobs for humans or do I want better outcome for humanity? Yeah, so the, the basic thing is then you start to ask, what do I want for humanity and what do I want as an individual? And as an individual, you want some basic survival and on top of that, you want rich, fulfilling experiences. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And as an individual, I gain a tremendous amount from teaching at MIT. This is like an extremely fulfilling job. I often joke about if I, if I were a billionaire in the stock market, I would pay MIT an exorbitant amount of money to let me work day in, day out, all night with the smartest people in the world. And that's what I already have. So that that's a very fulfilling experience for me. But why would I deprive those students from a better advisor if they can have one? Take them.